All right. So for your lab number four, hopefully you're working hard on that. It will be due on Friday, I believe, right? So please check the deadline. And as usual, solution video will be made available to you. This lab is going to be very important to put things together. So we'll talk about it later. And your programming test number two, uh, I already received the result from the TA, but there will be some processing I have to do briefly. So you can hear back from me tomorrow, for sure, about programming test two. And for your written test number three, which will happen next Tuesday, and programming test number three, the Tuesday after, you will definitely hear back from me. Uh, well, you'll hear from me about the guideline. Okay, you can uh, just look forward to it. All right, a quick recap about what we covered last time. So we are pretty much approaching the end of the uh, inheritance discussion. There's still a number of small topics that we have to finish off definitely today. And we'll see if we can get into recursion today. I'm hoping that we can talk maybe a little bit about recursion. If not, that's okay. We can start you fresh next Monday. But let's now review about the instance operator. And these three lines over here are the typical lines you will see to actually kind of combine everything we have seen so far. Right? Let's start with something simple. When, whenever you see you declare some objects of type A, A can be any class, smartphone, res, resident student, student, whatever. And you're trying to assign some new dynamic type. And we know pretty well in order for this variable assignment to really compile, B must be a descendant class of A. That's something we have said so many times. Right? Just make sure you understand also the rationale. You, you must make sure B can fulfill the expectation of A. B is a descendant class of A, right? That one's simple. What we cover be, uh, maybe on Monday when we talk about typecasting was, let's say if you have a typecast over here, okay? So this is a typecast. So this is a cast. And you're trying to cast OBJ, which was declared to be A over here. And you're trying to cast that into some type. I just put question mark, question mark. It's just unknown, just for now. And we talk about as far as compilation is concerned, you can either do upward casting. If you try to cast upwards to the ancestor of A, that's OK. You can also try to cast downwards, maybe to all the descendants of A. That's also fine, right? As far as compilation is concerned, that's fine. Oh, by the way. You can see these classes over here will give you compilation error if you try to cast into them, right? So these will be neither ancestor nor descendants of the static type A, which means compilation error if you try to cast them. Compilation error if Casting the OBJ to them. Right? That's something we also spoke about last time. And whenever, if a cast actually compiles, you also have to worry about whether or not we'll run into class cast exception. Right? We also spoke about it last time. Let's just review what we said before. Class cast exception is a runtime phenomenon. So if you want to judge to see whether that will occur, you will have to consider not just static type, but also dynamic type. Right? That's something you definitely have to remember. Okay, so this will be something that will happen at the runtime. That means you have to consider dynamic type. Okay? And at the moment, we actually got dynamic type over here. Okay? And what classes will actually result in a class cast exception. Well, as long as you're trying to cast the OBJ down to certain classes that cannot really fulfill, the, uh, that whose expectation cannot be fulfilled by B, in that case, you got class cast exception. Okay, I'm gonna highlight it, which is over here. It's exactly the child class or other classes. Okay, so you can think about over here. Also here as well. So these classes, right? You can definitely, definitely refer back to the uh, smartphone example that we spoke about last time. So these classes are class cast exception. Right? 
because dynamic type B cannot fulfill their expectation. Right, let me just remind you very quickly. Remember last time in the very beginning of the lecture, just make sure you also understand about this more concrete example when we try to categorize all the cast over here. Right, just remember that page. You can review that, okay? All right, let me go back here. And then one more thing to say before we finish the recap from last time. And if you look at line number, oh, since we know, Whenever you're trying to do a typecast, you might run into class cast exception. So the most effective way to avoid it is by using the instance of operator, right? So you want to make sure if you're trying to cast OBJ into this particular cast type, you better make sure OBJ's dynamic type can fulfill the expectation of the type you're trying to cast into, right? That's kind of the logic. Let me make a final remark and then we can move on, okay? So this part over here is really to make sure that true, this, uh, this will evaluate to true if OBJ's dynamic type can fulfill the expectations of question mark, question mark, which is the cast type. Right? If you find any gap about the understanding over here, just refer to the lecture from uh, last class. Right? Everything has been discussed in detail. I'm just trying to remind you about the different points. Okay. Any question until now? Any clarification needed for uh, typecast, class cast exception, instance of, anything? We okay, right? Okay. And this is where we left off from last time. Let me just remind you one more thing and then we can move on to doing some exercise together. And we basically talk about how the method parameters can be polymorphic. I'll try to dive into the polymorphism part a little bit more in just a moment. But let's just remind the critical thing we learned last time. Point number one, if you declare an array of students and the students happen to be part of the hierarchy, if you remember student, resident student, non-resident student, if that's what we do, you want to remember every element in the array has the static type students. That's what we said in the, at the end last time, okay, number one. Number two, we talk about why this particular variable assignment will actually compile. So you want to look up the static type for RS, which is the parameter, and also look up the static type for the array element, which is students, and it will actually work. Final thing, before we do the exercise together. When you are trying to call this method at RS over here, and you have to combine call by value that we learned right before the aggregation lecture. So whenever you're passing some argument O over here, and the corresponding parameter is RS, implicitly, there would be an assignment that's going to be RS is assigned to O, right? Basically, the parameter RS is assigned O. And once you get to that variable assignment, you would know what kind of substitution rule you will be subject to. So that means the argument's static type must be a descendant cl class of the static type of the parameter. That's how we reason about it. Okay, that's basically what we covered last time before we ended the lecture. Are you guys okay so far? Right, it's only recap. Let's now do exercises to confirm your understanding, okay? Let me switch to the slides. We got two sets of exercises for you. Let's start with something simple as a warm up. Okay, let's say we have uh, several variables. We got S1, we got S2, we got S3, we got RS, oh, and RS. We got so many, all right? And I want you to tell yourself right away, okay? What would be the static type? and dynamic type for each reference variable. That's something you want to tell yourself right away. Right? That should be quite obvious. Number one, and we also declare another variable SMS, student management system. Okay? And now we are going to do the various method call, and we want to see which one will be valid and which one will not be valid, when I say, well, I mean compilation-wise. 
Okay, let's take a look. For the first one, I'm going to do that together with you. Okay? Let's take a look at the first one. Should this compile or not? Okay? Before, uh, I'll give you one hint. Before, uh, in order for you to judge, you want to, first of all, identify the method that's being called. So add rs, corris oh, sorry. Add rs corresponds to this method over here. So it's, again, called by value. You're passing argument s1 to parameter rs. Based on the call by value principle, we know that call by value is going to be ferrets. What will be the corresponding assignment? Absolutely, because you got it wrong last time, so that's why I'm pointing at you. I still remember. Thank you. All right, guys, as, soon, as long as you can get this part right, then you're fine. All right? So now, would this compile or not? Ferris, why don't you help us on this one? Uh huh. Exactly. So S1 over here has the static type. If you try to look at S1, it has static type students. I'll just put S over here. RS is the parameter which is, has de been declared of having static type resident students. Static type is resident students. Students is not a descending class of resident students. So that's why it would not compile. Are we OK with the first one? Every other line will follow just the same principle. OK? Now, let's try. Marcus, how about this one here? Add rs, s2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the same reason, absolutely. And notice one thing here, which I'm pretty sure Marcus understands. For s2 here, even though its dynamic type is resident students, it doesn't matter because we only look at a static type, which is also students. Navid, go ahead. This one here. S3 static type students, and then which is not a descendant class of the parameter for add rs, which is resident students. Good, I agree. Very good. All right, I should really point somebody here. I should try. Okay, don't be shy. You know, it's okay to be wrong. No penalty, right? Abby. This one compiled. Yes, I agree. Why? Absolutely, very good. Okay, very quickly, RS, the argument, has the static type resident students over here. That one there is definitely a descending class of the parameter type, which is also resident students. So that one's good. Okay, the, these two, this one here, should not be valid. If you look at this one here, because NRS, static type is re non-resident students which is not a descending class of the parameter type, which is resident student, right? That's why you wouldn't compile, right? If you follow the same logic, that's what you will see all over here. So, so here, I try to give you all the possible combinations of arguments and the method that's being called. So you guys' job is to make sure you're convinced by each one of them. You might just be given something similar to judge, okay? And I want to make a very quick remark about this. Okay, you can notice that number one, we talk about at rs, right? These are all about. Oh, sorry, let me do it again. These are all about at rs. And if you just recall yourself, it's at rs method and resident students, the parameter rs. On the other hand, 
these methods being called are the S students. And then I want you to put them side by side, S students. And it will be students as a static parameter type, S. OK? Now, notice one thing. For this method over here, whose static type is simply the top of the student hierarchy, you can actually accept all the possible arguments. On the other hand, if you actually choose the static type for the parameter to be RS, which is not exactly on the top, so you can see here is the parameter type. What can be the possible arguments? All its descendants, in this case, only itself. So you don't have many options. So that's why the only thing that passes is this one here. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is, in the method parameter type, the higher the class is in the hierarchy, the more types of arguments it can accept. That's basically uh, the remark. I'm going to write it down. Okay? That's something I would like you to see as well. Okay? The higher the static type of parameter is, the more types of arguments it can accept. Okay? So this one here, being the parameter type, is definitely more accepting than this one being the parameter type, because this one is higher. All right? That's really the remark I would like to make. Okay? Any question so far? We okay? Okay. And let's do another exercise now that we have warm up. Okay. And this page over here actually corresponds to, I believe, the next four slides. So it will be slide number 79 all the way to 83. I'm going to talk about, oh, 82, sorry. All the way to here. I'm going to talk about them all at once on a single page because they are somehow relevant. Okay, let me guide you through them. Okay. And the method we have to consider is at RS. You can see its a parameter type is not as accommodating as being students, number one, as we just remarked. So you can only accept any descendant class of resident student being the argument. Okay? That's number one. So just remember we're talking about this method here. And question number one. Consider this method call, right? I believe that's maybe the question I gave to Abby. Remember for S, if you look at the previous, line, uh, previous page, S was, uh, oh, you know what? Let me just put it here, okay, just to be more complete. Let's assume we simply got students S, okay, declared. You can also assume it's not null. You set to some objects at some point. If I have this method call over here, is it going to compile? That's a question for you. Oh, sorry. I mean here. Beg your pardon. We got this uh, variable declaration here. I want you to uh, consider just this one here. Is it going to compile? This one here. Calling at RS with argument S. Anybody want to try? Just for this one. It's re related to what we just talked about. Marcus, you want to? No? Why? Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. So basically, the argument high S is students, which is not a descending class of parameter type, which is resident student. Absolutely. OK, good. So number one you want to notice is, if you try to do add RS, S, it's not going to compile. And it doesn't really matter what the dynamic type is. It can be dynamic type students, it can be dynamic type non-resident students. It can also be dynamic type resident student. Doesn't matter. For each case, we only use a uh, static type to judge. Number one. Okay. Number two. I want you to consider. Oh, you know what? Let me put it side by side. 
given that when we say SMS dot at RS, and then if I simply put S over here, as we just discussed, this is not going to compile. And what about this one here? This line here. Is it going to compile? I can tell you where the complication might be. So there are two things you want to consider. Number one, you're trying to do a cast. Is the cast OK? Number one. Number two, after the cast, or more precisely, anonymous cast, can the anonymous cast be passed as argument to this method? So there are two things you want to judge. All right? Let's start with the first one. Is the cast OK? Compile. Does it compile? Abby, would you think that will compile? Just the cast. In order to compile, it should be either upward or downward cast. Right? Do you think it's downward or upward? Downward, because S was declared as students, we're casting downwards to resident student, right? Okay, good. So there are two things. Okay, I'm gonna write here. For this particular line, I'm going to talk about two things. Number one, this particular cast will compile. This is actually okay because it's downward cast. And if you recall about the cast, we said that once you have done the cast, the expression there is going to have static type corresponding to the cast type, which is resident students. So can we actually pass this cast objects or alias to this method? Can we do that? In order to judge, you want to think about this particular cast. Number one, you want to think, so this particular, the, the cast has this particular cast expression has the static type corresponding to what you want to cast that to be, static type, resident students. And can you pass a resident students objects into add RS? Can you? Of course you can, because RS, the argument type, is a descendant class of the parameter type, which is resident students. So these are the two points you want to notice. Let me recap again. Number one, the cast itself is a downward cast, so it is okay, it will compile. Number two, given that the cast expression has the type resident students, of course you can pass resident student arguments into a method whose parameter type is resident students. That's also fine. So these are the two points, okay? Now, we want to consider more. Given that the cast compiles, are we gonna run into class cast exception? That's the question. So that's why you will see one, two, and three over here. All three of them, if you look back to the slides, we try to fix the original compilation issue over here by adding a cast. So everything will compile, okay? But are we gonna write into any runtime exception for any one of them? That's the question, okay? So you want to think about for this one here, we're gonna say sms dot at rs, and then we try to cast resident students s. This one here, let me write it down just to be complete. At rs resident students s as well, and sms at rs, oh, let me do it again, dot at rs, and also cast to resident students s, right? This one, this one, this one, they all compile, but is there any one of them going to run into class cast exception? Number one here, number two here, number three here. Any one of them. And of course, in order to judge about class cast exception, you have to consider their dynamic type, which are kind of different, right? 
Marcus, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Very good. Absolutely. So these two over here, dynamic types cannot fulfill the expectations of the cast type, which is resident students. Right? Apparently, you can see students cannot fulfill resident students. Non-resident students also cannot fulfill resident students. On the other hand, this one here will be the only line that's actually going to number one, compile, and number two, not run into class cast exception. Okay. So this will be the only line. So this one here will be compile, and no class cast exception. That's the only one. Right? That's really an, a very important example over here. It kind of connects to what we talk about, whether or not a cast will compile, and also whether a compilable cast will run into class cast exception. And also, we try to do call by value by treating the cast expression as the uh, arguments. Right? So these are the three things you want to study. All right? And finally, if you look at this one here, is that one going to compile even? This one, no. Okay, I can just tell you the answer directly. NRS has the static type non-resident students. Okay? And we are trying to cast non-resident students into resident students. Are we even allowed to do that? No, because the cast type is neither ancestor nor descendants. So it's not even going to compile. So you don't even need to discuss about class cast exception. All right. All right, let me just put a final remark and then we are done with uh, these, few pay, uh, these few slides. Okay. So this one here, not compile. Because the cast type, which is resident students, neither ancestor nor descendants of the static type, of the static type, which is non-resident students. Okay. Okay, any question about these examples altogether? I can see so many things we are trying to connect together. We okay? Good. Okay, so the next one would be, we want to talk about a polymorphic collection of students. Okay, this would be how we can connect to a number of lectures before. When I said we're going to talk about polymorphic array. Okay, let's take a look. If you recall the very original problem that we actually want to solve, we want to have a student management system where we got two kinds of students to be stored. Okay? And we talk about different designs before we got to inheritance, and now let's try to compare what we can do with inheritance versus without inheritance. This will be the final version of the student management system we have. So we declare the class, and you can see we have a single array of static type students. All right? And then we have a single method over here as students. The parameter type is students. And we said before, given that parameter type students, what can be the possible argument types that we can add in? It can be it, it's, uh, all its descendants. And then there's only a single array. And what about we want to register a single course to all the students? In that case, we only need a single loop. I'm going to go over this final version together with you very soon. But I want you to really compare to the following. There is a link on your slide here. If you click on that, that will bring you back to our original discussion. Let's say without the inheritance. How would you do that? You have to declare one array for resident students. 
another array for non-resident students because they have nothing to do with each other by inheritance. So as how many kinds of students means how many arrays you need without inheritance. And you need two counters, and also you need also two separate methods for, for these to add, for add into the corresponding array. And if you want to register a common course for all the students, you also need two loops rather than a single loop. So this is really the, the point that you want to compare how the student management system can be implemented with inheritance and without. That's really the something you want to uh, convince yourself. All right, and let's go back to this polymorphic version. And let's now trace this code together. We, all really, we really need to know how the polymorphism and also dynamic binding actually work for this example here. Let's take a look. Okay. And if we go to the next slide, uh, simply some test the code that we gotta go over together. Let's do that. Okay, let me just tell you what I got on this page. So this is the student management system, and then we got a single array. Every element in the array has static type students. And we have a single method whose parameter is the top of the hierarchy, just students, okay? And of course, how you actually add element into the array is standard, nothing surprising there. And if you want to register a single method, oh, sorry, a single course into all the students, all you do is you simply say students i that register. That part is interesting, okay? We wanna see how exactly this will work at the runtime. Okay, and, and I'll explain to you the no notion about polymorphic array. Okay, let's do that. So let's now consider the test code just over here. Let's go line by line. Let's say this line here, we are trying to create an RS students, resident students, okay? And you can see the static type, dynamic type, just happen to be the same, okay? So we have RS over here. You can see RS is a resident student. And we have uh, just the name Rachel. So that's why you see Rachel over here. And initially, you just got all the courses maybe pointing to not. We're gonna register course for Rachel in a moment. And we'll set a premium rate for RS to be 1.5. So that's why you see 1.5 over here, right? I got a diagram there just to save time, but we definitely should know how to visualize it. So that's the first objects. So, so far we have only created just the resident student objects, just that one, which is RS, right? And let's move on to create the second objects. If you look at that, the second one is called NRS over here, right? You can see for static type, dynamic type, just the same. And then we want to set the discount rate for NRS to be 0.5. So you can see here we got NRS, the second object here, dynamic type is non-resident students. And we got discount rate to be 0 0.5 over here, right? So far so good. What we want to do now is to create a student management system objects and store its address in SMS, okay? And let's now consider these two lines which will be very important, okay? These two lines over here. Individually, they compile for the reason that we just discussed in the warm-up exercise. Quickly, RS declared to be resident students. That's the arguments. What about as students? As students, according to the definition, has the parameter type students. So definitely it compiles because resident students argument type is a descendant class of student over here. Similarly, NRS with the static type non-resident students is also a descendant class of the same method parameter, which is students. Are we okay so far? Both of them compile. And why do I say polymorphism over here? I wouldn't trouble you for now, but make sure you study the definition for polymorphism for next week and for the exam. Okay, let's now talk about this quickly. If I look at these, okay, the parameter type, the parameter type is actually students. 
which is over here. Accepting arguments of its descendant classes. Right? So here, descending class is really the key. All right? So that's why both of them will be accepted. And what's going to happen after we have executed these two lines? What we will have done will be we want to add this object here and also this object here into the array of the student management system. Let's take a look. You see, for the student management system, we just got in a single array. Let me just uh, remind you about its uh, declaration. SS, oh, actually, you can take a look here, too. SS, uh, also, also I mean student here, SS, the same. Okay? The static type students for each element. So you just remember it's actually a student's array, SS. Now, take a look. Every element in the array, for example, element one, element two, or element index zero, element index one, all these has the static type students. Let me just try to write this one here so that'll be clearer to you. Okay, let me just clear this part here. Static type will be students. Now, Every element in the array has the static type students, as we declare. Dynamically, because of polymorphism, we can pass any arguments whose des descendant class of students. There we go. Resident students and non-resident students. So what do we have? We have every element here whose static type is always students the same. But its dynamic type might be different. So this is what's so-called that uh, polymorphic array. Okay, I'll write it down here. Polymorphic array. The same static type for each array elements. In this case, just students. But maybe different dynamic types for elements of the array. For example, the first element, resident students, the second element, non-resident students. Quick recap. How can we create a polymorphic array where we got different dynamic types for the elements? Number one, you need some inheritance hierarchy. Number two, you want to make sure the array over here has the static type that can actually accommodate multiple descendants. If you simply choose resident students to be the array type, that wouldn't accommodate many. It only accommodates itself. There's no descendants uh, underneath. On the other hand, if we choose the student to be the static type here, we can accommodate student itself, resident students, and non-resident students. So that's why by calling these two, uh, by making these two calls to the same method, we are able to put these two objects dynamically different into the same array. That's polymorphic array. I'll pause now for you to think a little bit. Polymorphic array is a very important consequence of everything we have said so far. So it's so important for you to see. Is there any confusion here? Or anything you find, you might need some repetition. Okay? Or should I assume everybody's okay? All right? Just remember, that's how you create a polymorphic array. And then we're going to have just a single course, let's say 2030. So we have a course over here, let's say 2030. And this will be the course that we have. Let's say for that common course, we want to register that into every student contained in the array. So this will be where we put, put it. Oh, sorry. Let's look at this line here. This line. Register all. Okay? You can see register all is calling this method over here. Okay? And when we actually try to call this method here, when we try to execute this line, so we'll call the method here, 
we're going to run the loop. And depending on how many students we have, how many iterations are we going to have for this register on? How many? Based on the diagram. Would it be 100? Or depends on the counter over here, right? So we're only going to have two iterations, one here and one here. Right? Don't lose the basic. That's what, actually what we said before in the review lecture. If I try to execute this method over here for the first iteration, well, think about what's going to happen here. I here is going to be either 0 or 1 because we got either index 0 or index 1. Only two objects being stored over here, only two. And then for the first iteration, what do we do? For the first iteration, we will try to do students at index 0 dot register C, the course. And for iteration 2, we're going to say students at index 1 also register C. And of course, the C here is really just the ECS 2030, but that's OK. All right. Now, let's discuss about these two iterations. How does dynamic binding work over here? We are basically calling the same method, register. And we said before, dynamic binding simply means the version of the method being called depends on the dynamic type of the context objects. Right? So now, you want to really ask yourself over here, according to dynamic binding, which version of register method is invoked? OK, I will pause here and let you think about over here. The first iteration is going to call some version of the register. And the second version is also going to call another version of the register. And I will bring up this diagram over here as well for you to look at. Right? How many versions of register do we have in this case, according to it? Apparently, we have register here, right? That's actually declared in the students. In this case, do we have any overridden version of the register? We don't. So that means the same version of register is inherited to here and also inherited to here. Okay? So in this case, it's kind of simple. Because for the very first iteration, when we say register, we want to find the version of register that's in, what's the dynamic type? It's simply resident students. That one there has just a default version that's inherited from students. Okay? And for the second iteration, student one has the dynamic type. You can see index one is really referring to non-resident students. That class over there also inherits the default version. So the same version. But one little exercise I will encourage you to do. I'll write down over here. What if? Okay, if I say students i dot get tuition in that case, are we going to call the same version of get tuition in first iteration and the second iteration? Right? That's something you want to think. Okay? That'll be some exercise for you. All right. Dynamic binding is simply, uh, let me just uh, reca uh, recap about what you should know. If you're trying to call this register all, you're actually going to have two iterations. The first iteration, you're going to talk about this object here. Dynamically, it's resident students. The second iteration, you're going to talk about non-resident students dynamically. Dynamic binding tells you, this tells you you should really call the version of register that's defined in resident students. In the second iteration, Dynamic type of student at index one is non-resident student. 
that will be the version. But in this case, they just happen to be the same. But in general, they may be different. So that's why I, I would like you to try get tuition. Okay. And this part over here is after the register. It's really the kind of the exercise I actually just uh, asked you to do. Okay. This part here. I'll talk about instance of a bit, and then we're done with this example. So here, we also got dynamic binding. Because the I over here, you can see, uh, depends, we got two students. I could be zero, I could be one. Depending on which iteration we are, we are actually going to call different versions of the get tuition, right? For this one here, it's going to use the premium rates. And for this one here, it's going to use a discount rate, different versions, okay? And it can definitely use the instance of operator to check the dynamic type. Because we know at index zero, dynamically, it's pointing to a resident student's objects. So now, what class can resident students fulfill its expectation? Right? So that's why if you try this, okay, let's say we got instance of check right over here, right? Let's just take a look at the first one. SMS, students array at index zero. It's really referring to this particular object. Dynamically, it's resident students. Can resident students fulfill non-resident students? Apparently, it cannot, right? This one is going to give you False, okay? Can resident students fulfill resident student itself? Of course, it's gonna be true. Okay? Can resident student fulfill students? Yes, true. So this instance of checks is pretty much what we did on Monday. The only complication is now we are using a polymorphic array SS, in which case you have to watch out for which index we are referring to, which might have a different dynamic type. Okay, let's look at the other one as well. Let me just say one more thing here. So the SS, as we said, is a polymorphic array. Okay, and then let's now take a look at the second one. Here, we also try to do instance of check, but now the index we're looking at is index one. So that one there is referring to non-resident students, a different dynamic type. In that case, what result are we going to get? One, two, and three. Since the dynamic type is different, so the instance of checks should have different result. Agree? Anyone? True or false for each one of them? Anybody other than Ferris, I would love to point to you, but let's see if anybody would like to try. Marcus, would you like to try? Let's see. You said true, false, true? Maybe. All we gotta decide would be, uh, index one is really pointing to non-resident students. Can non-resident students fulfill, non-resident student, for sure, that's right. Can non-resident student fulfill Resident student, no, it cannot. And can non-resident student fulfill students? Yes. Yeah, that's correct, good. And of course, you can see the result is actually different, especially for these two, right? They are different because the dynamic types are different at different indices. It's a very long example over here, even though it's only a, a small uh, number of lines of code, but it shows many things about building polymorphic array and how you can do runtime dynamic type checks using instance of. So these are all important for you to learn. Okay, if you don't quite get it today, that's okay, but make sure you get ready. Study the slides, struggle a bit, and then clarify with me if you want. Okay, you definitely need this for next week and the exam, for sure. Any question about this in general? Any part that may not be so making sense to you, you can feel free to speak up now. We okay? All right. Question. Ferrets, please. Six and seven. Okay. 
Yes. No, we are not. Very good, very good question. No, we are not, Ferris. Let me try to use a clean page to illustrate. We're talking about six and seven. Okay, think about what we're doing here. RS and RS. RS has, uh, RS is pointing to, let me talk about types only. Dynamically, it's pointing to resident students. Also, its static type is also resident students. Okay? For NRS, it is uh, of static type NRS. As we declare here, it's pointing to another object, which is NRS over here. So far, we got dynamic types and also static type like this. So far we okay, right? Okay, good. Let's get to the student management system. Because we declare the array to be of type students. Every element in the array has the static type students. So let's visualize it. So let's see. So you got SMS points to some student management system objects. You got students array. Of course, it's of certain length. Let's only talk about index zero, index one, all the way, okay? So now, this is how you should think about it. Index zero has the static type students. Index one also has the static type students, okay? Now, critical point to answer your question. When we try to execute the line number six, we are not really modifying the static type of RS. Just remember the principle, you can never modify static type. Here, we are trying to say, can we assign RS into something that's expecting students? Yes, we can. So what we're doing is we're just moving this pointer over here. Everything still got their static type the same, never modify. The reason that we could do this particular variable assignment is because this is a descending class of that. So that's why we can do it. Okay, good. Similarly, we also got this. Okay, Ferris, I hope that answers your question, right? Good. No problem. Okay, so that's about polymorphic method parameters. Okay. And this one here just summarizes about polymorphic array. You guys can definitely take a look. Everything has been discussed. Okay. And it's now a good time to maybe take a short break and taking attendance. And we're going to talk about return types, which will be the last second topic about inheritance. Why don't we do that? Okay, let me start the class. Oh. All right, yeah, check in, please. If you got any trouble, come forward right away. Once I close the poll, that's it. Can I close it? If you need time, raise your hand right away. Okay, we're good, right? Okay, I'm gonna close it, awesome. If you're on the side, just go over to the front. Okay, it's now 9.27. Why don't we take a four minutes break? 9.31, four minutes, and then we'll go back to cover the return types. Yeah, take a break, and then we'll talk about return types after the break.
Yeah, I got a pen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, two minutes, and then we'll resume. Okay, one minute. All right, let's resume. We've got about roughly 20 minutes, so we can at least uh, hopefully finish return type and the equals method. Okay, then we are pretty much done. All right, so now about return types, we also can bring polymorphism into play and also polymorphic array. If you kind of get what we just talked about before the break about polymorphic array, this one is a very natural extension to it, very natural. Let's say we still got student management system here. We declare array students, static type students, the same as before, nothing new. And we also got as students, you can see the parameter type is the most accommodating, the top of the uh, hierarchy, right? Nothing new. And this will be something new. We want to declare a, an accessor method, which has a return type. And now the return type over here, we say it should be a students. Okay, what does that mean? That means, think about this is like a method that can be called by some caller. The caller calling this method here is expecting to have a students. Now, if I am expecting a students, can you give me a resident student objects at the runtime? Yes, because resident students can fulfill students. If I'm expecting a student, can you give me a non-resident students? Yes, that's also possible, right? So what we're gonna see, let me give you a little bit look ahead. We're gonna build some polymorphic array. Dynamically, we got resident students, we also got non-resident students. And when we call get students with some index i, will explain that in a moment. Get students statically will give me just a students. But dynamically, it could be any of the descendant classes of the object it's gonna give to me. It could give me a resident students, it can also give me a non-resident students. All right, let's look ahead. Now let's see how to achieve this. And we're gonna have some local variable. So here I deliberately choose a variable that has the static type corresponding to the return type so you can see more easily. Think about this variable here is something that we gotta return back to any potential caller. And uh, we just say uh, the index here is simply gonna say index uh, of some students that has been stored into the array. So that's why we want to make sure it's uh, lar uh, larger than zero. So here, if either it's negative or it's actually too large, then we'll give some exception, right? That one's easy to see. If it is valid, just return SSI. And now if you recall what we said about polymorphic parameters just before the break, when we have SSI dynamically, it could be non-resident students also or resident students. Right, so that's why the return objects can be different. Let me make some notes and then we'll trace some code. Here, very important for you guys to see several things. If you look at this expression here, okay, I want to say several things. Let's 
do a quick review from what was covered before the break. SS is a polymorphic array. Polymorphic array, which has two properties. Number one, every element at index i has the static type students. That's always fixed. Number two, SSI, okay, just make sure you can see that. SSI has dynamic type A descendants of the static type, which is students. Could be resident students, can be non-resident students, for example. All right, that's something you want to see. And we're now going to see how we can use this method here to see what can be the return value from this method. And we're going to do some manipulation on that, which is rather simple. OK, let's take a look. When you look at the code, this part here is exactly the same as what we just traced before the break, which is over here, about creating that polymorphic array. So for this part, I'm going to just skip. And you can definitely refer to the recording if needed. So this part over here, let me just highlight them. Just this part is just to create a polymorphic array. What would that cover? That's going to have an array over here. Statically, it's just going to be students for every element. Dynamically, it has resident students over here and also non-resident students. Right? That's something we assume. And let's now try to look at over here. Okay, that's what we're going to look at. Okay, number one. Let's say we declare some students variable s. We say that one is going to be assigned the return value of this call. Okay, now we want to see number one whether or not this line here will compile. What you want to see is the right hand side has certain static type. That static type must be a descendant of students, right? That's the substitution rule that we have been speaking about. Now, question, guys. What would be the static type for this and why? Static type, that's what I'm talking about. When you want to figure out the static type, you only need to look at that creation. No tracing just yet. What would be the static type for this method call on index 0? Ferrets. Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's the return type, just be clear, right? OK, good. And one thing to note, doesn't matter if you pass 0 or 1, doesn't matter. As far as the compilation is concerned, this method here always returns something of static type students. That's what's declared. OK, let's get it straight first. So you want to see here, and also here, all of, both of them has the static type students. Okay, so that's what you can look at. I'll just point to here and also point to over here. All right, just make sure. And given that the static type is students, student is a descendant of itself. So that's why this variable assignment here is fine, it's valid. And similarly, this one is fine too. Okay, now let's see more. Let's now worry a little bit more about dynamic type. If I try to execute this line of code over here, sms.getStudents at index 0. If I try to execute it, okay, let's say this one here. I will try to execute this method over here, and I will just end up executing this line. I'm going to return s S is actually going to point to SSI. What's I at this moment? I, zero, right? So in this case, we're going to return SSI. What is, oh, SS0, beg your pardon, in this case. What will be SS0? SS array at index zero is pointing to an object dynamically resident students. So you can think about the return value S is really pointing to over here this object dynamically. Let me recap for you quickly. 
when you try to call this method over here, it's going to execute over here. If you get to this point, the return value s is going to be assigned to the polymorphic array ss at index i, which is zero in this case. Index zero of that array is pointing to dynamically a resident student objects. So that's why I can say return value is s over here. All right, are we good so far? And then I'm saying that I'm just going to let s uh, pointing there, right? That's exactly what I just did, okay? Once you have got this, we're going to check several things. Number one, let's check something simple. If I say s instance of students, would that be okay? Because resident students dynamic type can fulfill student expectation for sure. Resident student can also fulfill resident student expectation. On the other hand, if I say this, can resident student fulfill non-resident students? No, that's why you will get false, okay? And if I try this, s.get tuition, according to dynamic binding, which version of get tuition am I going to call? If you recall the hierarchy uh, over here, over here, how many get tuition methods do we have? Here, or here, or here, right? So Ferris, which version would we call? Exactly, because that's the dynamic type, okay? All right, so this one here, you can, dynamic binding. So this one here, the version of resident students is actually going to be called. That's what you will see as a comment. Are we okay so far? Okay. What we have done is this method here, get students, is going to return at index zero, just this object. And let's now try to do this line over here. We're going to reassign s into another call to the same method. But now we're passing one. All right. Let's see what difference it's going to make. So what we're going to get is, you can see one here is the arguments. So we are calling this method for the second time. And when we get to the same line over here, we're going to return ss1, which is over here with dynamic type non-resident students. S, rather than pointing to over here, you can think about s is actually now going to point to this object over here with a different dynamic type. So similar checks as before. If you try to do the instance of check, s, s, and s. Can non-resident students fulfill students? Yes. Can non-resident student fulfill itself? Also yes. Can, resident, uh, can non-resident students fulfill resident students? No. Right? You can see here. The dynamic, dynamic type, non-resident student cannot fulfill resident students because it's neither ancestor. Sorry, let me say it again. In order for this instance of the uh, operator to return true, you want to make sure the dynamic type over here can fulfill this type, but it's not the case, right? Finally, if we try to do this line again, s.getTuition over here, if you compare this, and also this. Are we going to call the same version of get tuition? Apparently not, because S is now dynamically pointing to non-resident students. So that means you're going to call the non-resident student version. Okay. Over here. Okay. Any question? That's, uh, in some way, it's only a very natural extension to what we just talked about before the break. We, the only complication is the objects that's being returned is through some excessive method with some static type as a return type. That's what we have, we're doing, okay? Any question about this? If I give you any code similar to this, so you should know to judge the various things that we actually spoke about. One more thing before we get to maybe equals method very quickly. One more thing. I want you to look at this line. Okay, the one I just highlighted in orange. 
Okay, I'll make it larger. Okay, this line here. Should it compile? In order to judge, you ought to know what would be the static type for this method call. Right? As we said before, the static type for the return value here depends on how you declare that to be, which is students. Right? So let me annotate it a bit. So think about this part over here. The static type is simply just the students. And we are trying to assign students into resident student. Is it allowed according to the substitution? No, it's not allowed, obviously, right? At this point, hopefully you are already quite mechanical about doing this kind of substitution. You want to get ready uh, for any relevant assessment, okay? So that's why we got no over here, right? It doesn't compile. All right, that's it about return types, okay? That's what you will see, and then that's the code we just went over line by line. And also, this is just a reminder, again, just about the polymorphic array. So the, only, the most important takeaway for today is about how you can build polymorphic array, how, and how you can manipulate it, okay? A few more slides, we got about five minutes, okay? A few more slides, and then hopefully we can finish the equals method. And then there might be some recap slides I can do on Monday, and we can move on to recursion. And this is really, go back to the very beginning of the inheritance discussion, when should we use static type? And when should we use dynamic type, right? Let's review the principle. Whenever you just want to see whether the Java code will com compile, you look at the static type. Look at where the methods or where the variables are declared. That's all you look at. And if you want to somehow try to judge either what will be the version of the method that will be called, in that case, you definitely have to look at the dynamic type to see which version, dynamic binding. Or if you want to see whether a compilable cast will run into class cast exception, in that case, you definitely also have to look at the dynamic type, right? So these are the main two scenarios you want to consider. So I would say this slide here summarizes the principle that we have been following along for all the examples, okay? And I will do this table as a wrap up of uh, all the inheritance lecture, maybe on Monday. That's something I will do. It's completely symbolic, but I think that's really important to see what's really the rationale behind, which we all talk about in the examples. I'll do this slide maybe in the beginning on Monday, just to wrap up. And Let's talk about the equals method, briefly, okay? Basically, for the, uh, this slide here, just about review, about the equals method that's declared in the object class, right? Remember, objects is the superclass for every class. And this is something we also spoke about in the equals lecture, right? So that one there, I don't need to repeat. And similarly, for the toString method, that's also a method that's declared in the object class, so that will be inherited to every class. And I actually talk about the toString method in the review tutorial in week number one and two, if you recall, okay? Now, we just want to do some very quick examples about figuring out which version of the equals method that will be invoked. The principle will be over here. There are three scenarios. Let me summarize very quickly. You can read the slides by yourself. Scenario one, if the equals method was not overridden, you always call it default. If, oh, let me say that again. If the uh, equals method was overridden in the current class, you call that version. If it was not overridden, then there are two subcases. Either along the ancestor path, there is some overridden version, you use that one. Or if there's no overridden along the ancestor path, you use the default version. So these are the three cases. But well, let's see example. It sounds a little bit confusing when you want to just talk about principle. Let's look at the examples, and we are done for today. Example one. Let's say we got three classes, A, B, and C. B extends A, C extends B. Implicitly, A also extends from object. Of course, you can argue that B also extends objects. C also extends object, but implicitly, that's also true, right? Good. 
Are we okay so far? And in this case, none of the three classes over here try to override the equals method. So there's only one version, only one, okay? And let's say we got three lines of code over here. We got object, object, C and C. Oh, by the way, should this be, be compiling? It will compile if C is a descendant of objects. It's always the case, right? That's kind of uh, obvious. And let's say we got C1, we got C2, and we want to see which version of equals will be called when we say C1 dot equals C2. In order to see which version will be called, you have to look at the dynamic type of C1. C1 has the dynamic type C, which is over here. Okay, over here. And now in this case, this will be the principle. You want to think about what Java would do. It will look at the current class corresponding to the dynamic type. If that one has equals method overridden, call that one. But there's no. Go to its parents. Does it override equals? No. Go to its parents. Go all the way. In this case, we'll go all the way to objects. So that will be the version to call. So this is the simplest case. Just call the object version. Okay, scenario number two, which is also actually simple. So here the difference is we try to overwrite, oh, sorry, we try to overwrite the equals method in C. And C over here happens to be the dynamic type for the context objects, which is over here. And now when we try to say C1 dot equals C2, According to dynamic binding, we look to see whether the dynamic type has the equals method defined. Indeed. So this version will be called. All right? So that'll be the version. That's scenario number two. So we go from either the extreme where none of the ancestor got the overridden version for the equals. We call it default. Another extreme would be we just got this class being the dynamic type. Over, uh, has, which has overridden the equals, in which case we just call that. Let's see some way in between, and that, that'll be it. I know I'm running over time, give me one minute, okay? I promise, just one minute. What about this one here? C being the dynamic type, okay, is here. Itself has not overridden the equals method. So now, when I say C1 dot equals C2, which version would we call? Here's the principle. Look for the dynamic type. If it has not overridden the equals, go to its parents. In this case, it does. Okay? And this will be the version to call. Let me just say one more thing, if you don't mind. Version here. So now, how many versions do we have? One, two, and three. If we say C1 dot equals C2, which version will we call? Version one, version two, version three. Closest one. Okay, you basically go for the overridden version in the closest ancestor. I'll write it down, and then we are done. I do appreciate your patience. Let me write it down. Okay, this one will be the overridden version version of the closest ancestor. All right, at this point, we are basically done with all the topics about inheritance. Just have one or two more slides to summarize. So what you guys should do before Monday, I'm going to tell you the coverage for the written test number three, either later today or tomorrow. You can definitely start going over the inheritance lecture. I'll definitely give you some practice questions as well. This will be a nice review also for the exam. And then, yeah, that's it. And on Monday, we're going to move on to recursion for sure. Okay? I'll see you guys later. Have a good weekend.